All right, good morning, students. I'm on page four now. No, I'm not. I'm on page five now. This is the second half of chapter one. Um, so page five, read with me. His father was a mechanical engineer who designed or invented a new drill bit for oil drilling, a self-cleaning, self-sharpening bit. He was working in the oil fields of Canada up on the tree line where the tundra started and the forest ended. That's Mr. Martin. <coughs> Brian was flying up from New York with some drilling equipment. It was lashed down in the rear of the plane <coughs> next to a fabric bag the pilot had called a survival pack which had emergency supplies in case they had to make an emergency landing. I'm eating chocolate, by the way. I don't know, I'll swallow. That had to be specially made in the city. Flying in a bush plane with the pilot named Jim or Jake or something who had turned out to be an all right guy, letting him fly and all. Except for the smell. Now there was a constant odour. And Brian took another look at the pilot, found him rubbing the shoulder and down the arm now. The left arm letting go more gas and wincing. Probably something he ate. His mother had driven him from the city to meet the plane at Hampton, where it came to pick up the drilling equipment. A drive in silence, a long drive in silence. Two and a half hours of sitting in the car, staring out of the window, just as he was now staring out of the window of the plane. Once, after an hour, when they were out of the city, she turned to him. Look, can't we talk this over? Can't we talk this out? Can't you tell me what's bothering you? And there were the words again. Divorce. Split. The secret. How could he tell her what he knew? So he had remained silent, shook his head and continued to stare, unseeing at the countryside. And his mother had gone back to driving, only to speak to him one more time when they were close to Hampton. She reached back <clears throat> over the seat and brought up a paper bag. I got something for you for the trip. Brian took the bag and opened the top. Inside there was a hatchet, the kind with a steel handle and a rubber hand grip. The head was in a stout leather case that had a brass riveted belt loop. It goes on your belt. His mother spoke without looking at him. There were some farm trucks on the road and now she, and she had to weave through them and watch the traffic. The man at the shop said you could use it, you know, in the woods with your father. Dad, he thought, not my father, my dad. Thanks, it's really nice. But the words sounded hollow even to Brian. Try it on, see how it looks on your belt. And he would normally have said no, would normally have said that it looked too naff to have a hatchet on your belt. Those were the normal things, he would say. But her voice was thin if you touched it and he felt bad for not speaking to her. Knowing what he knew, even with the anger, the white-hot hate of his anger at her, he still felt bad for not speaking to her. And so to humour her, he loosened his belt and pulled the right side out and put the hatchet on and re-threaded the belt. Scooch round so I can see. He moved round in the seat, feeling only slightly ridiculous. She nodded, just like a scout, my little scout. And there was the tenderness in her voice that she had when he was small. The tenderness that she had when he was small and sick with a cold. And she put her hand on his forehead. And the burning came into his eyes again. And he had to turn away from her and looked out of the window. Forgotten the hatchet and so arrived at the plane with the hatchet still on his belt. Because it was a bush flight from a small airport, there had been no security. And the plane had been waiting with the engine running when he arrived. And he grabbed his suitcase and pack bag and run for the, <clears throat> for the plane without stopping to remove the hatchet. So it was still on his belt. At first he had been embarrassed, but the pilot had said nothing about it. And Brian forgot it as, as they took off and began flying. More smell now. Bad. Brian turned again to glance at the pilot, who had both hands on his stomach and was grimacing in pain, reaching for the left shoulder. Again, as Brian watched. Don't know, kid. The pilot's words were a hiss, barely audible. Bad aches here. Bad aches. Thought it was something I ate, but... He stopped as a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how bad it was. 
The pain drove the pilot back into the seat, back and down. I've never had anything like this. The pilot reached for the switch on his mic cord, his hand coming up in a small arc from his stomach. And he flipped the switch and said, This is flight 46. And now a jolt took him like a hammer blow, so forcefully that he seemed to crash back into the seat. And Brian reached for him, could not understand at first what it was, could not know. And then knew. Brian knew. The pilot's mouth went rigid. He swore and jerked a short series of slams into the seat, holding his shoulder now. Swore and hissed, chest, oh God, my chest is coming apart. Brian knew now. The pilot was having a heart attack. Brian had been in the shopping mall with his mother when a man in front of Paisley's store had suffered a heart attack. He had gone down and screamed about his chest. An old man, much older than the pilot. Brian knew the pilot was having a heart attack. And even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time. One more powerful slam into the seat. Well, one more awful time. He slammed back into the seat and his right leg jerked, pulling the plane to the side in a sudden twist. And his head fell forward and spit came. Spit came from the corners of his mouth and his legs contracted up into the seat. And his eyes rolled back in his head until there was only white. Only white for his eyes, and the smell became worse. Filled the cockpit, and all of it so fast, so incredibly fast, that Brian's mind could not take it in at first. Could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a moment ago. Complaining of the pain, he'd been talking. Then the jolts had come. The jolts that took the pilot back had come, and now Brian sat and there was a strange feeling of silence in the thrumming roar of the engine. A strange feeling of silence and being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped. Inside he was stopped. He could not think past what he saw, what he felt. All was stopped. The very core of him, the very centre of Brian Robeson was stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror. A terror so intense that his breathing, his thinking and nearly his heart had stopped. Seconds passed. Seconds it became all of his life and he began to know what he was seeing, began to understand what he saw. And that was worse, so much worse, that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in a bush plane, roaring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness, with a pilot who had suffered a massive heart attack, and who was either dead or in something close to a coma. He was alone. In the roaring plane with no pilot, he was alone. Alone. Okay, that's the end of chapter one. Uh, go back over it if you need to and find any words that you don't know and write them down. Bye.